Hello, this is Felix Felix on eToro. In today's video, I'd like to ask and answer one simple question about eToro copy trading. What is going wrong? As you may know, over the past two years, I've made over 270 videos about eToro, primarily on the subject of copy trading. So as such, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way, but I've certainly learned and observed a lot of things about eToro copy trading. And in today's video, I'm going to put together those observations into one coherent theory about how I think eToro copy trading should work when it's at its best, but also why I believe currently it is operating in a suboptimal manner. In my next video, I'm going to go on to suggest some solutions to what I perceive as those problems. Just before I start, I want to do two disclaimers. Firstly, this is not financial advice. And secondly, everything I'm about to say is my personal opinion. And since I don't work for eToro, I'm not privy to the knowledge that the people in eToro know, which might actually affect what I'm about to say. And there may be some vital information I'm missing out on. But to the best of my ability, I'm going to present my theory about the current state of eToro copy trading. This slide's entitled The Fundamental Problem with eToro Copy Trading in 2022. Now, how do I know that there is a fundamental problem? Well, this year we've seen an abnormally large amount of copier funds being lost by both PIs and non-PIs. The obvious explanation for this would be that we're in a volatile market. The stock market's been in a bear market, crypto is tanking rapidly, and there's been huge volatility across the board. However, I don't think it's inevitable that people's money needs to be lost in this fashion and at this high rate by the people they're copying. And to me, this has occurred through a number of factors, including irresponsible high-risk trading by these PIs and non-PIs, a lack of basic knowledge about bankroll management, and also in many cases, people misleading their copiers about the amount of risk that's involved, or even about what that person's track record has been historically. So why has all this happened or been allowed to happen? And also how do we prevent it from happening in future? As I mentioned at the start, in this video, I'm going to just deal with the first of those issues, which is why it's happened and been allowed to happen. In the next video, I'm going to go through a framework of solutions that I believe would have prevented a lot of this from happening. So today we're dealing with the problem. Next video, we will deal with the solution. So the question is, why has it happened then? In my opinion, it's happened due to a disturbance in the delicate equilibrium that is necessary to keep the copy trading ecosystem intact and operating effectively. So that's a complicated mouthful. But to put it another way, I think in any ecosystem, whether we're talking about the financial system, the legal system, or even the natural environment, then there needs to be checks and balances that are required to keep systems running smoothly, orderly, and optimally. If there's any imbalance in the system, in finance, you see money being lost. In law, you see lawlessness and crimes being unpunished. And in nature, you see the environment being damaged. So there needs to be a balance in the ecosystem an equilibrium if you like. So if these checks and balances are not present, the system will fall into complete disarray and in eToro terms, copier funds will be lost. And that's what's happened. So what I'm going to do is give some non-eToro examples and then move on to how this applies to eToro. The first non-eToro example I'm going to give you of an equilibrium is the UK separation of powers. We have three bodies here. The executive, which is essentially the government, currently ably led by Bojo. We've got the legislature, which is parliament as a whole, sits in the House of Commons and Lords and passes laws, and the judiciary enforces those laws, but also can make laws of its own through case law and precedent within the court system. If any one of those three parties steps out of line, it's brought back into line by the other two. For example, if Boris goes off on one, then parliament can often overrule him, especially with the help from his own politicians, and the judiciary can also step in, as they did when he tried to prorogue parliament. Likewise, if a judge was to go rogue, then the legislature can step in and remove that judge and so on and so forth. So all the three parties uh, and bodies here can interact with each other in such a way that an equilibrium is preserved and no one has power over the other two. That is an equilibrium. Okay, the second example is slightly different because it involves a contract of employment with three elements rather than three different bodies. But the elements are firstly your job duties that you're asked to do as a requirement of the job. Secondly, what job satisfaction do you get from that job? And thirdly, what salary do you get paid? Now, it would be quite unusual for someone to be asked to do job duties, but get absolutely no job satisfaction or any salary from it. There would be no incentive to stay. Likewise, if someone was getting paid a salary, but they absolutely hated their job and the job duties were too difficult for them to do, that would probably result in them leaving the job. 
So really you need at least two, preferably all three of these conditions to be present in order for a contract of employment to operate successfully. Otherwise things start to go wrong and people will likely leave the job. So now we're moving on to eToro and we'll see what I've identified as the three elements of a successful PI scheme. And this is three things. Firstly, a PI has responsibility for managing large sums of money on behalf of a large amount of copiers compared to a non-PI. So non-PIs are capped or supposedly capped to a small amount of money, which almost invariably means a small amount of copiers. Second facet here you've got is reward. So in return for this responsibility that you're taking on, eToro pays you a salary, you appear in searches and promotions on the Discover page, you get club to your benefits, such as being invited to live events, like others, one taking place in London this month. So that's the reward. However, you don't just get the reward and the responsibility, there are also obligations. There are rules about responsible trading, effective communication with copiers, clear strategy, an accurate bio, and you have to have a certain amount of money in your, in your balance in order to retain your PI status. So those three factors all operate in harmony and lead to the eToro PI scheme running properly. So now I'm going to examine what happens if one or more of those factors are missing, how it can all go wrong. So here's my theory as to why one of those factors on its own is not enough to guarantee an effective copy trading system. If you're going to pay somebody a reward, but without giving them any responsibilities or any obligations, then that's completely illogical because you're basically giving them money for doing nothing. So that wouldn't work. Secondly, if you give someone a list of rules and obligations and restrict how they trade, but you're not actually giving them any other people's money to manage and you're not giving them any payment in order for managing their own money or other people's money, then there's absolutely no reason why someone would trade in a restricted fashion if there was no money to actually manage or there was no reward given for managing it. So this leads us on to the third one, which is by far the most important, is if you give someone the responsibility of managing large sums of money, but you don't give them any reward and you don't give any rules or obligations required of them as to how to manage the money, then what this is going to lead to is irresponsible money management because first of all, there's no consequences for mismanaging money, so there's no obligations, and secondly, there's no financial incentive for managing the money well. So they've got all the responsibility of managing large amounts of money, but they've got absolutely none of the reward or none of the punishment or obligation associated with doing a bad job of it. So it goes further than that though, so hopefully I've proven that one of the factors is not enough, but I would also say two of them is also not enough, and it comes down to a carrot and stick approach. So if you give someone the responsibility of managing money and you give them a reward for doing so, but you don't have any obligation or any punishment for not doing a good job, then there'll be no incentive for that person to manage the people's money properly because they know they're going to get the reward anyway, regardless of whether they meet the observations. So in simple terms, you can't have the carrot without the stick. You must have the stick present in order to motivate that person because the, otherwise they won't fear the loss of the carrot. I'll give you an example of this and it's someone who I've covered in the channel many times and he's just getting worse and worse. It's big profits. You can see here he's lost 51% this year, 60% drawdown in total, but he's still managing over 300 grand. So here we've got a situation where someone has a huge responsibility, they're managing over 300k and secondly they're receiving a reward because he's still not copy blocked and he's still on a PI scheme so he's receiving 400 to 800 per month. However, he's not got any obligations, or he has, but he's not following them. He's not communicating his strategy effectively, describing himself as, as low risk, and he's also not trading in a responsible manner. I mean, look at how much he's lost in a short space of time. So there you've got two of the factors present and one of them absent. And you can see there, unless you have effective obligations or rules enforced by eToro, then Big Profits has got absolutely no incentive to actually meet his responsibility of managing people's money responsibly because he doesn't fear losing the reward. He can pretty much do anything he wants outside of hitting risk seven, which he's managed not to sustain doing, but he still lost 60% in the process. So he can pretty much do anything he wants without losing his reward. So that's what happens when you remove the obligations from the equation. As you've seen from the last slide, removing the obligations from the equation completely wrecks the whole system. However, what happens if we either remove the responsibility or the reward? Well, if you remove the responsibility, then you would just have someone being offered a reward and also following a set of rules, but they wouldn't actually be doing anything. They wouldn't actually have any money to manage. So that would clearly be illogical and would make no sense. The, the obligations and the reward are created 
in order to incentivize people to take their responsibility seriously. But if there was no responsibility, you wouldn't need the reward or the obligations. And also moving on, if you had a set of obligations and also had a huge responsibility, so you were taking on someone else's money and you were following a lot of rules and restricting your own trading, but you weren't given any money for doing so, then that wouldn't really be the best system in the world because you'd be a whole load of downsides and rules you have to follow and there wouldn't be anything you're getting positive in return. So you need the reward element really to make the system work. So put simply, you can't have the stick without the carrot. And as we've seen on the last slide, you also can't have the carrot without the stick. They're both essential and they both pair up with the actual responsibility, which is why you need the carrot and the stick. Okay, I hope you're following so far, but in case you aren't, then I'm going to summarize what we've covered so far. A responsibility is a necessary element of being a PI, but on its own, it's not sufficient. You need to have rewards and also obligations slash rules to follow in order to make sure people take the responsibility seriously. We've seen the outcome if that doesn't happen. Secondly, as a PI, there needs to be some sort of reward or at least a promise of a reward somewhere down the line. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the incentive for taking the responsibility seriously or for following the obligations and the rules to the letter. And lastly, the obligations are very necessary because they provide consequences such as taking away people's reward if they don't meet their responsibilities. So all three of those elements to me need to be present in order to have a properly functioning PI scheme. And let's look at an example of it working properly. Here's Yeppy Kirk Bond. So as you'll see, he's got a long track record there and through the course of all those years, he hasn't blown up his bankroll or lost any significant amounts, especially compared to how the market's performing. So really, that's an example of someone who's been steady and consistent from day one on eToro to present day. And you can see there from his graph, his risk and his drawdown are stable and consistent. He's got a lot of copiers, he's managing a lot of money. So what's been the secret to Yepi's success, if you like? Well, it's, it's these three things operating in tandem. First of all, he's got a responsibility over $50 million of other people's money. So that's a big responsibility. But hand in hand with that comes a huge reward. He's getting paid over a million a year by eToro. So the reward compensates him for the burden of that responsibility. But thirdly, and most importantly, he actually fulfills his obligations, such as communicating his strategy and trading responsibly. If he didn't do that, then the reward would be taken away and this responsibility would also be taken away from them in the form of being kicked off the PI scheme. That's obviously all assuming that eToro would be doing their job properly. So overall, Yepi is incentivized to undertake the huge responsibility of managing that money and he's doing so by fulfilling obligations and he's being compensated in the form of a large reward. So it all melds together perfectly and it's not in his interest to gamble with people's money or to deceive or lie to people or to break any of Vitoro's rules because he's got a lot to lose here and also the people who are copying him have got a lot to lose. So, so it's, a, it's a symbiotic relationship where everyone is getting something out of it, including eToro, Yepi and his copiers. That is copy trading working well. And there's a lot of examples of that. To be honest, most of the Black Star and Elite PIs are resembling that sort of a trajectory. So we've covered PIs and how having all three of these elements present can lead to a good copy trading experience. But how does all this apply to non-PIs? Because one of the themes of this year is seeing non-PIs managing large sums of money and indeed losing those sums of money on behalf of their copiers. So for me, the central problem with the non-PIs is only one of the three elements is present. We have a responsibility for managing huge sums of money, and this is done by finding loopholes in the system, which we'll talk about later. So for whatever reason, these people are able to handle huge amounts of money, despite not being a PI, and they're given no reward for handling that money in terms of a PI payment or promotion or recognition from eToro, but also they're not having to follow any rules, such as keeping the risk score down or following any of the other rules of the PI scheme. So they've got all the responsibility, none of the reward and none of the obligation. So essentially they have very little to gain or lose out of the arrangement because if they do well, if they've taken high risk in order to do well, they still won't be allowed in the PI scheme and they won't be paid. On the other hand, if they do badly, often non-PIs are operating on pretty small account balance. So it won't really bother them too much just to close their account and start up a new one. So for this to work at all, and I haven't really seen any examples of it working properly, the non-PI would have to self-regulate themselves and have a very strong sense of moral responsibility because they don't have the reward and the obligation. They don't have eToro giving them anything or putting any pressure on them in order to go do a good job. So that's why I'm very concerned about non-PIs handling large amounts of money because you've only got one of the three trifecta of, of factors that I've outlined 
So let's look at an example. And I know there's been more recent examples and it's probably one you're thinking of now, but I'm going to go way back a year or so to Yen Dizzy because this was actually in some ways what started it all for me. Um, and Yen Dizzy, just to remind you, was a non-popular investor who last year, start of 2021, was able to take on over a million dollars of other people's money on behalf of hundreds of people, despite the fact she had almost zero trading experience. I think she had less than six months experience trading and some of that I think was on the virtual account. Now, how she was able to do this, I don't know. She just didn't get copy blocked. I don't know why that was, whether it was deliberate or was it, whether there's a fault with eToro system, but she was able to take on a huge amount of money and not being a PI, she didn't get paid anything by eToro for managing this million dollars of other people's money. And she had absolutely no rules governing her as regards what she could invest in, how much leverage she could use, what asset classes. So what she did really was stuck all her money in crypto pretty much. She made a bunch of money initially, then she lost a bunch of money after people had hopped on, hundreds of thousands disappeared. She then turned her account private, even though she still had over 100 copiers, and she left eToro made it public again and said, I'm leaving eToro, I need my money for university or school fees. So this was an example of all the responsibility, but none of the reward or the obligations. And really it was an absolute disaster. Uh, obviously one point of view is the copiers knew what they were doing and they took that risk. However, I don't think it's good for eToro's reputation. I don't think it's good for Yentizzi herself. I don't think it's good for the copiers that over a million dollars was at risk and some of that was lost before she made a sharp exit. So ideally, I'd like to avoid this sort of thing happening. Or if I was eToro, I'd like to avoid it. Obviously, it doesn't personally directly affect me, although there are indirect effects if the regulators get involved. Um, so why has this all been allowed to happen? What, what's happened with the Yendizzi? What's happened with big profits? How, how have they been doing all this? Well, in my opinion, there's two reasons. First of all, the rules that eToro have got about copy trading, either for PIs and non-PIs, have got a number of loopholes. So this has allowed people to take on far more assets under management than they should have been, far more copiers than they should have been, and take far more risk than they should be able to um, by essentially manipulating, circumventing, finding loopholes in the system. I've went through them in previous videos, uh, so I'm sure you can you can think to what those are. Secondly, though, is even when the rules have been in place, clearly in place, sometimes eToro systems of detection and taking action have been woefully lacking. For example, Carmen Zavia hit risk score nine and was clearly breaking all the rules of the PI scheme, lost a lot of money, didn't communicate with copiers, yet she was still allowed to stay on the PI scheme. She was still allowed to use leverage and she's still going strong, so to speak. I gather you don't get paid when you're copy blocked, but once that copy blocks up, no doubt she'll be back up and running, get paid again. We've also seen people like GP Master blowing a bunch of money, risk score 10, restarting a new account. So if eToro had actually enforced the rules properly, such as not letting people in the PI scheme unless they've been on eToro for two months, immediately throwing people off if they hit risk 9 or 10 and so on, then if that had been done properly, all of this could have been prevented. So part of it is people exploiting the rules and secondly, it's eToro not enforcing their own rules strongly enough. So my summary and conclusion is as follows. For eToro copy trading to work effectively, three factors would ideally need to be present. We need to have the responsibility of managing large amounts of other people's money, but that must be paired with a reward or an incentive for doing that well and an obligation or a punishment for doing it badly. And if you have only one of those things, or even if you have two of those things, then this is going to cause an imbalance in the equilibrium and people will then not be encouraged to trade responsibly by being given incentives and they won't be discouraged from trading irresponsibly by being threatened with consequences. So all of the huge losses of copier capital that we've seen this year, I covered in my videos, have invariably been driven by one or more of those three factors being missing. And that applies to PIs and non-PIs. So in the next video, what I'll do is outline some of the modifications that I think eToro could make to the copy trading system in order to restore this balance and ensure that the whole copy trading system is working effectively and, and these large amounts of people's money are not being lost because with prudent bankroll management, even in the most volatile of environments, there's no real reason for people to be blowing up their bankroll and more concerningly, hundreds of thousands of dollars of other people's money. It shouldn't be happening. It doesn't need to be happening. In the next video, I'm going to suggest something Zitoru can do to stop that happening. So hopefully you've enjoyed the video. As always, I look forward to reading your comments and see you on the next one.